Welcome back to the Conference Center for this Global Spec Machine Tools and Metalworking E event. I'm Jim Brennan. To ask a question of our presenter, it's simple. Just click on the Submit Question button, enter your question, and hit Send. And to get your own copy of the PowerPoint slides, you can click on Download PPT. Now, in any machine shop, large or small, the time lost due to refixturing equals money lost. One of the biggest hurdles to spindle optimization is work holding setup and changeover. And joining us now, and you'll see that he's a little passionate about this subject, is Bernie Martin of Rapid Production Marketing. Bernie, thanks so much for being part of our Global Spec online conference. Jim, thanks a lot for having me at your event. Um, and I know you that you prefaced that by saying we're going to talk about work holding, but maybe the better place to start in this whole conversation is to talk about cutting tools. Uh, because work holding gets neglected somewhat. Typically in a shop, you're, you're going to be testing carbide inserts all the time. And the scenario looks like this. Salesman comes in, you run the inserts, and at the end of the test, you know, the salesman's crunching the numbers on his calculator, and he says, well, you know, Jim, looks like over the course of the year, I'm going to be able to save you X amount of dollars on the setup time, and, and here's your cost, and it's 17 seconds per part, and your cost per edge is this and that, and, and you look at them and you say, that's great. Why don't you come back tomorrow? I've got some other parts to run. So the salesman looks at you and says, why do I need to come back tomorrow? Can we run it now? Well, no, I've got to change the fixture. Maybe that's the discussion that needs to be happening more often. Because if you're talking about shaving 17 seconds, 15 seconds off of part set or cutting times, and the fixturing time is four hours, eight hours, that's not only four hours of downtime, that's four hours of, of what economists call opportunity cost. So it's four hours of uptime that you're losing. So fixturing can play a significant role in, in where your shop makes or doesn't make money. So what we're going to cover today is uh, some understanding. We're going to talk about a little bit about some lean concepts, not go into an awful lot of detail on it. Uh, we're going to then talk about some foundation systems some vice fixturing, magnetic fixturing, some vacuum, and some modular issues. The picture that you see here with all these geometric shapes is really one of the best places to start. When you go into your shop, you've got to take a look around and, and put everything into geometric shapes. Uh, just families of parts and say, what are my sizes? But before we get into that, let's take a look at this picture here. Um, this is a typical CNC mill with a vice on it. And I want you to remember this picture because we're going to come back to this and, and take a peek at it again. See if you know what's wrong with it. The interesting thing about fixturing is this problem that we've had with fixturing has gone on for quite a while. Way back in 1939 in the original patent application for the Bridgeport uh, milling machine, you can see that it says changing the setup of the work on its support table an operation which greatly slows up production and increases the likelihood of inaccuracy in the finished work. We've had this problem for years. It's gone back to the original milling machines with Eli Lilly. We're still setting up things the same way we did in 1939. That has led to bottlenecks. In lean term, this is Mura. It's unevenness. When you implement lean in a manufacturing facility, in a job shop, even if your machines are all running at, at top performance, you're still only going to hit about 80 to 85 percent spindle optimization, which means the spindle is only in the cut 80 to 85 percent of the day. Now, that's a pretty good number, but that's what lean shops are doing. That last 15 to 20 percent is where the pro it's generally work holding. And I've been into a lot of facilities that have implemented lean. They say, oh, wait, I've hit 85 percent, I've hit 83 percent. What's the problem? fixturing, setup, changeover. Part of the problem is that different shops have different needs. Some of them are going to need vices. Some of them may need round chucks to hold round parts on a mill. Some of them might need magnetic work holding or magnetic fixtures of some sort. And there's different kinds of magnetic fixtures. They could be permanent magnets or, or electro-perm magnets. Some need vacuum. The point here is that there's no single manufacturer out there who makes one solution that's going to work for every shop. Within the shop, within the facility, there's all kinds of different needs that you have. The T-slot has been the way that everybody puts things together and maybe it might be time to change over that T-slot to something else 
or it might be time to figure out how to standardize something on top of that within your facility. Again, when we talk about shops that have implemented lean, it's an 80 to 85 percent spindle optimization rate. Typical machine shop though, you're at about 12 to 15 percent spindle optimization. You'd like to be up on that other side. What I'd like you to do is, is just stop for a minute and think about your shop. And when we're done with this, take a walk outside into your facility, look around. How many green lights are going on on the machines? If there's not a lot of green lights, you're probably in the 12 to 15 percent, and that's okay. But the key here is you want to make your machines productive as, for as many working hours as possible. If they're not cutting chips, you're not making money. You're actually losing money because that's that opportunity cost. So think about your shop, think about ways that you might be able to improve things. First, you've got to recognize if there is a problem. We're going to come back to that picture that we talked about a little bit ago. So the first thing to do is that what, what's in lean is Genshi Genbutsu. Go and see for yourself. Don't go in and try to solve all the problems of the world. Look at your families of part sizes. Look at the product groups that you're doing. Can you put them into geometric shapes? squares, rounds, how big, what's your envelope sizes. You got to look at your families of parts and where your money comes from first, where, where your production numbers come from, where your job shop lot sizes come from. Group them into families. Doesn't matter what they are, just put them in sizes. This is a good start. This is not a simple, short-term, quick turnaround process. Lot size also becomes critical. If you're doing 30 parts or if you're doing 30,000 parts, that's going to dictate your next step in this process after you figure out what the shapes are. <clears throat> the next part of this is you need to look at your, your envelope size on your machines. Remember, we're talking about milling fixturing, so there's verticals and there's horizontals. It's pretty simple. However, there's different tables. So let's just take, for example, a 40 by 20 table. 40 inches by 20 inches is a typical, most common size table sold out there in, in the North American market. And quite frankly, I, I believe in the world, uh, but don't quote me on that. If I've got a 40 by 20 table, how much real estate do I realistically have? I recognize that in some machines, although I've got a 40 by 20 table, I may have 23 inches in Y of travel, in, so it's beyond the 20, but only 38 or 39 inches in X. You've got to look at not only the table size, but what your travel sizes are and build it for the smallest travel size available. That becomes your next piece of the standard. Same with the horizontals. You've got to look at that work envelope for your horizontals. How big is it? How far can I come out in Z axis? Once you have all the constraints there, you basically can create a standard. Here's how big, here's how tall, here's how wide I can go. Here's my parts and how do they group into here. It seems pretty simple, but most facilities don't go through that process. They don't look at their average part sizes. They don't look at what their average table sizes are. So how can I transfer things from one machine to the other? Let's take a look at this picture now. Is this table space maximized? How long is it going to take me to change to a new setup? I've got one part on the machine, one setup. I got to go do something else then. I got to change it over. It could be. We don't know. Every shop's needs are different. Take a look at this one now. We've got two double station vices here with a, a, an index or a rotary table on the right. Now, is this the right solution for the shop? Well, it could be. You've got an index. Or the, what if that only runs once for a job once a month? In that case, it's taking up a whole bunch of space that it only needs to be there for two days for a run. That's okay, but you're losing a lot of space where you could be utilizing it for something else. The problem is, is that you have to sweep in and indicate everything in here. Then you leave it on the machine. Another example, this is a whole different setup. So picture that last machine and now I want to go to big magnetic uh, vices. To change that over, is this a good solution to go to? Again, everyone's different. It really has to start with the foundation. There's a couple of foundation systems. We're not going to cover all of them today, but uh, as an example, this is the Jurgens ball lock. You'll notice that it has four ball bearings in it. There's a central ball bearing that comes down, locates it out, so it's five tenths repeatability, uh, 
three ball bearings come out. That's why a three-legged bar stool is stable. It finds center. This finds center. So you can put different size plates on top and on the bottom. And you can have these plates to any size you want. So once you've determined, again, back on the horizontal and the vertical side, what that best optimized space is, so let's pretend that I can put down this square plate on a table. Can I then take that square plate and put it on the side of a tombstone? If it doesn't line up and I haven't pre-planned that, I'm kind of behind the eight ball. So ball lock again goes down in, there's a receiver bushing pops down in, and you're probably familiar with this, plenty of videos out there on this. Another system that's quite similar to it is the uh, uh, M-Power system. The receivers are essentially the same, same bolt hole pattern. This one doesn't have any ball bearings, it just threads down in with a standard screw. Um, same repeatability. Another nice solution for a foundation system. My point being here with the foundation system, there's a couple of systems that you can use. What you need for your shop is going to vary, but you should look at something that's going to get the changeover off of the machine quicker. And again, how this system works, quite similar to the ball lock. You've got liner bushings, everything comes down, locates. The basis of all this is that now you can mount, as you see here, you've got, you've got three vices sitting on top of Jurgen's ball lock plate that's then mounted down. So when I want to change the vices off, I take the plates off with the vices on it, I put something else down. I can put an electro perm magnet chuck down, I can put vacuum chucks down, I can have dedicated fixtures that are positioned back onto there pretty quickly. So that's what you're seeing with the engine block here. Step back and let's talk about some vices. The United States is, is kind of unique because in 1964, Kurt introduced the angle lock. It addressed a major problem that we had before that. When vices clamp, you've seen in your bench vise at home, they do this. They deflect open. What Kurt did was they set up an internal structure to that vise that says for every pound of forward force, there's a half pound downward force. So the parts actually get pushed down into the part or into the vice bed itself. Great thing, from 64 on, Kurt has dominated that market. Wonderful product. You see it in machines all over the place. And it's really an ideal thing because in 1964, this is pre-CNC, where NC tape machines were just, you know, that was the advent of them. Interesting solution. The design, because it's from the 60s, is made for the kind of machines that you're seeing in these pictures. It's a different type of bed, it's a different type of work, it's a single operator, and yeah, maybe we have controllers on these machines, but this isn't CNC stuff. But what's happened is, because all these curved vices have been out there, all these single station vices, I start off and I say, okay, I've got more work. So I take my first vice, and I buy a second one and put it right next to that. And then I put a third one right next to that. That looks efficient, but if you look at the, the Overall dimensions of a single station vise, you've got about 16 inches by, I believe it's nine and a half inches. No, that's off the top of my head. With that 16 by nine, you've only got a workable space of six inches wide, and depending on the travel of the vise that you've got. But it's, it's, it's the wrong shape. The tables go this way. You're not using all the X. You're not using all the Y. But you've gone down a path, and you've invested a lot of money to put a bunch of single stations on there. Now, this becomes a little bit more efficient. This becomes a bunch of double station vices on that table. Now I've got two parts in there. The vices are utilizing the space a little bit more effectively because they're not wide, they're thinner, they're longer and can hold more parts and there's some more versatility. You still have that problem with the fourth axis jobs. <clears throat> now take a look at this picture again. We've covered some ground here, but I think you can see where some of the problems are. So bottom line is there's a lot of solutions for in vice fixturing. There's Kurt, there's Toolex, there's Jurgens, there's Chick. And a lot of times I'll get the question from people and say, what's the best one of these? And this is just a sampling. You know, we certainly can't cover everything of the more popular ones. There's no right or wrong answer to that. It depends on what your shop needs. If you've made some decisions already on what you, you're using, and it could be Kurt Chick, Tool X, Jurgen, Stevens, that's great. Is it the right longer term solution for your shop? 
because when you start looking at the work holding, and particularly vices, this isn't an inexpensive proposition that you're getting into. You may decide that because of the envelope capacities, because of the z-axis heights, because of certain functions, it fits into your family of parts. It may not fit into somebody else's family of parts. So there's really no right or wrong answer in which one of the vice manufacturers to choose. Uh, just to continue, on, on the double station vices, um, this is one of the things that you may want to look at. And it's, it's what is the travel? What is my part capacity? And they vary. Some of them open further, some of them open less. If your family's of parts that you've grouped them into when you went and looked around the shop, this fits, then maybe these are the ones for you. And there's a multitude of solutions out there. The key is, is that you want to maximize out all the table space if you're going to be using double station vices. You want to be able to gang them together and have as much versatility as possible. There's a bunch of situations to where you might want to have the outside jaws flip around or maybe they don't need to flip around. Maybe you have a family of parts to where here's op one, you flip it over, here's op two, and you put it back. If you can index the jaws around, that might be a feature that appeals to you. If you're not doing that, maybe that feature's not important to you. Maybe it's detrimental. There's some other products out there, um, and, and this is a picture of a Stevens vise. It's a low profile design, and you can put it on a grid pattern, but you can do larger parts, and you can mount it as long or as far apart as you want. It's, it's good to be aware of some of these niche things. Stevens also has what's called a soft brick vise. I'm not sure that uh, a lot of people have seen this. It's relatively new on the market. It's made from 6061 T6, and it's basically one big machinable jaw. The key is, is how are you going to mount it down? So remember, I, I'd like you to keep in mind throughout all of this that although we're now talking about some niche solution type products, you've got to remember to go back to that foundation issue. How are these things going to fit? If I have to mount these Stevens brick vices down, how are they mounting? How am I changing them over? That's the question that you've got to keep in the back of your head, especially as we start to see five axis machines. There's more mill turn machines coming out there. Their needs for fixturing are a little bit different. You want to be able to access all the sides of a part it becomes pretty important. So you want to take that into consideration as well. Within that, there's a, there's a number of five axis uh, fixturing systems that are coming out, not only with the small five axis vices, but you'll see here, this is a Raptor work holding system. It's a dovetail system, elevates everything up in the Z axis. You can machine all the way around the part, plenty of clearance mountings on the bottom. So it's not really a vice, you're actually, you're milling dovetails on the bottom of the part before you do any of the ops, but you can access all the sides. Again, different solutions. Again, how's it fitting in your work pieces? Even on the vice side, I mean, you've got options where you want a 16-sided vice, you want it hydraulic, you want it pneumatic, you want it hexagon-shaped, you want multiple stations in there. All this stuff is available. It's how does it work in unison with the other stuff that you have for fixturing. Let's jump to magnets, because we've talked about vices, and magnets are a nice solution for anything that's, well, magnetic. Um, you already know that there's a north and a south pole, and if you break the magnet in half, you're still going to have a north and a south pole. But the important thing to understand about magnets and how they work is what's called a flux line, and that's where those fields are. So if you picture on a, on a magnet that there's an imaginary arc, a flux line, the key is, is that you want to have your part in that magnetic field. So the problem with magnets that people have had in the past is that the magnet's pretty far apart, the poles are pretty far apart, the flux line goes through it, and the part moves. Well, it's a magnet, it should hold. No, the bigger the magnet doesn't necessarily mean the better it's going to hold. Bigger parts are good, small parts bad. If your magnet's bigger, you want the flux line going through the part somewhere, not above the part. That's why these are good solutions. These are manual magnets. Pretty interesting solution. Again, relatively new on the market. The jaws on the top are machinable, so you can skim cut them off, trim them in, drop your parts down, fixture across, straddle them across multiple magnets. Again, nice thick parts, flux lines are going through it, not a big deal. 
You can get down to thinner parts. You can do five axis, so this is a good five axis solution. But you may need something that's, that's more permanent, and it may be an electroperm system. Now, the electroperm magnets are wonderful because once you turn them on, it's, a, it's a, going to be on forever. Um, it doesn't turn back off. How they work is you're either turning it on to pot, you're putting the flux line through the top or through the bottom. That's important to understand that because people will say, well, you know, if, if I lose power, will I lose magnetic holding force? N no, you've changed the flux line. It, it, you'll lose some residual magnetism, but the Earth is going to supernova into the sun before that part's going to let loose because that's how slow it's going to lose it. So again, there's a mag and a demag cycle with these. It's reversing the polarity, if you will. How they set up on a magnet is you have several fixed systems or, or fixed riser blocks and you're skim cutting those in and then the other blocks uh, are spring adjusted so they rise up and complete the connection with the part which then gives you the gripping power so it makes it solid but you're lifting everything off the table. Now, these are quad pole systems, and some people have tried magnets in the past that were parallel pole systems. Parallel pole systems were fantastic for grinding machines. Poles run this way, grinding runs perpendicular to it. The problem is in a mill, if I'm going milling parallel to the poles, parts tend to flip off. That's what the quad pole comes into play, because now you've got a square and those flux lines are all coming to the center. There's 50 millimeter, there's 75 pole or 75 millimeter systems. Uh, on a 50 millimeter system, typically you're looking at about two tons of holding force per, per pole, so that's pretty substantial. Um, be aware that if you have tried magnets before, parallel pole magnets, and, and you haven't tried any of the quad pole systems, you might want to explore these because they are a good solution. You can you can side mill on them, you can drill through them, and that's why the riser blocks are there so you're not actually going into the magnets. You can face mill on them, you can back face on them because you can get underneath the part. So they can do a lot more things than you might think and still maintain holding power. The problem with all of these, when we talked about the flux line, it's not how big or how heavy the part is, it's how thin or how small. Depending on who you talk to, depending on which manufacturer it is, at some point around a half an inch and below is where you start to run into issues. It could be three eighths, it could be half inch, but that thinner part, the poles have to be so close together, it becomes a problem to get the poles close enough to get the flux line going through the part. The other half of that is if you've got a round part, somewhere between 8 to 13 inches is where you start to have problems on quad poles with 50 millimeter systems. So picture an 8 inch diameter disc or 13. I need to cover enough area. So small, thin, that's where the problem is. If you got big stuff, good solution. They tend to flatten out the parts too. So if you've got some unevenness, um, they'll bring them flat if you've got some warpage coming in. This is a nice way to skim cut and trim everything in. Uh, this is a wonderful picture to take a peek at because um, a lot of people look at this picture and go, hey, I can, I can do round stock. I can do bar stock right here. The key to note on this, this picture is the flux line. There's a little stop on the part on the side. The flux line is going right through the middle of the bar, hitting the flux line and coming down against that stop. That's a nice setup because it's constant connection. Can you do this on everything? Mm, maybe not, but it's good to know. The other question that people have a lot of times on magnets is, what happens to all the chips? Well, if you already understand that the flux lines have to go through the part and thin is a problem, chips are pretty thin. So typically they don't stick to the part. You're not recutting chips uh, as you're machining through it. They're ejecting out. You may have some sticking right around the edges of the poles, but it's not going to be significant. Typically they fall away, so magnets become a pretty nice solution. Magnets are fantastic systems if you're doing something that's magnetic. But if you're doing aluminum or you're doing thin wall parts uh, that are copper, oxygen-free copper, beryllium copper, 
none of this stuff's magnetic. So you might want to look at vacuum fixturing. Now traditionally what people have done with vacuum fixturing is, is they haven't again come to a standard. I've got these parts, I'm going to make a custom vacuum fixture, I'm going to machine out the exact shape of that part, I'm going to drop it down in. As opposed to making a grid system or purchasing a grid system, and, and these are pictures of some grid systems that are on the market, and then you can put it together for which size you need. If you're doing larger production, that custom fixture makes sense. But maybe you could be changing that to a grid system that's a little bit more versatile, so you're not pitching that and it's not taking up a whole bunch of real estate somewhere in a tool crib on a shelf with a whole bunch of other fixtures. Um, maybe you could repurpose those. An alternative was invented by British Aerospace back in the 90s. It's a fantastic little solution. It's called a vac mat. Um, they, they're, they have on the top of them a whole series of, of suction cups, some little like an octopus, and they're different sizes and they have a pinhole through them. So even though you don't cover the entire vacuum mat area, the suction cups give you enough suction, so enough force down, vacuum force, to hold the parts in place. Great for thin wall. The vac mats are about 80 thou thick. You can machine 10 to 15 thou through them. They've got a whole grid pattern on the bottom of the mat. When you're done with it, then you can pitch it or you can bring it back. But it's a nice versatile system and I mean, there's different ways to use it. I mean, I've seen people uh, seal up mats with super glue just to seal off where they don't need. I mean, some versatility, very nice for doing parts that are different shapes because you can drop the vac mat down onto a fixture and not ruin the fixture and it's still going to give you clamping force all the way around um, airfoil type shapes. When you get to really thin parts, and now we're talking aluminum foil, 60,000 uh, 60, thick material, how do you machine that? Well, there are some porous chucks. There's some ceramic and metal sintered that are semi-porous material. So the parts can adhere down, but it's already a flat surface. So be aware that there are some really interesting vacuum solutions out there and take a look at them. Uh, again, the key is to go back and take a peek and see what's wrong in your shop right now. Are you doing things the way that you would like to be doing them? There's a multitude of solutions, but how do you make them work together? What I'd like you to do, if you've got a few minutes, is take a walk out. Remember what we talked about in the beginning? See how many lights are on or in your shop that are showing green. Take a look at your fixturing. Just look. Try to group things into parts. Jim, that's pretty much the presentation. Um, certainly contact me with any questions. I will be in the networking lounge after this to uh, talk about any questions that other people have. But if there's some questions that you've got from the audience, um, let me know. Well, it's our pleasure, Bernie, and we've got some questions that we've collected here. Let's see if we can answer them. First one says, when you talk about fixturing, you're talking about foundation systems. And we've got a lot of Schunk, Big Kaiser, and Unilock units on our shop floor, but you didn't address those systems. Why not? Time. Um, there's a lot of systems out there. Uh, these are great systems. Uh, the, the Unilocks are five tenths repeatability, I believe. Uh, if you've got those systems in place and they're working for you, and I apologize, we, didn't, we couldn't cover everything. Uh, tremendous systems. You can pair them up, you can move them around, you can put other types of fixturing off them. They're, they're wonderful foundation systems. All right, let's grab another one here. Do you have an opinion you can share on the 3R Delphin system? Ah, uh, 3R, uh, it, it, very good question. Uh, great system, it keeps expanding, really started out, the, the 3R folks really started out on the EDM side, they've expanded into the work holding side. Um, they used to be a little bit of a, a thorn, uh, a burr under my saddle is maybe the right word, because they had promoted that, you know, here's this 13 by 13 inch system that consumes a whole bunch of Z that it really made for EDMs. Uh, I. I was not a proponent of the 3R originally because, again, here's the X, Y, I'm only using this space. However, the Delphin system's pretty nice because now you can mount it, you can do bigger parts, and, and it becomes, again, a very nice foundation system. Uh, I, 
sorry we couldn't cover everything in this short amount of time, but there are tons of systems, and I encourage you to look and see what all the systems are out there. Look at everything as you go through this process in your shop of saying, how big are my travels? How big are my parts? What are my families? Explore all those systems. Okay, this next one says all the systems you've talked about are common in North America, but in Europe we deal with a lot more vices in our basic setups. Do you have any suggestions for European machine shops? Um, I feel for you. <laughs> I, 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 when we talked about in 64 that, that Kurt invents this vice, the, the angle lock that holds down, that became a de facto standard here. Anybody who came out with vices here in the States after that, that bolt hole pattern that mounts the jaws on, you had to make them to that because people were already making all these machinable jaws, these soft jaws that were mounting onto the Kurtz and nobody would buy a vice. So Kurt more or less created a de facto standard. In Europe, I feel for you, there's so many proprietary systems, so many different types of vices, none of the jaws seem interchangeable. It's, it's more of a problem there. I, I really do feel for you, and I, I, I don't know the right answer to that question. Uh, again, we had a limited amount of time to cover some issues here with regard to vices. I will say that there are some tremendous systems, some tremendous innovation because of not having that standard that have happened in Europe that, that I wish would come to North America and there could be some transfer. Uh, but that's kind of beside the point though too because as long as you're setting up that foundation system, you're going to be better, you can pound anything you want on the top. I hope that answered your question. This next one says, over the years, we've spent a lot of money on the fixturing we have in place. What exactly are you saying we should do? Ah, uh, so you've, you've put, you've gone down a path. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, Jim, that, that, that they mean that this is, you know, we've got a whole bunch of vices out there on the table. We've got a bunch of single station vices. Here's what I would encourage. Um, some other food for thought, if you will. Finding good machinists today isn't like it is, like it was. Uh, it's tough to find people. So this is a, a labor cost. If you take a look at your shop and you want to add more capacity, let's pretend that you're at 25% spindle optimization. Is it cheaper to buy a new machine? New, say another vertical or another horizontal might be a little bit different in case. But if you're thinking about buying another vertical to put on the floor and then hiring another person, what's the ultimate cost at the end of the year versus taking that investment that you've already got in capital uh, on, say, a bunch of single station vices, throwing those on eBay and replacing them with a standard? Is it going to be cheap? No. But if you don't have to buy another machine, if you don't have to add another unit of labor, I think you can see where their balance sheet works itself out. Again, these are your costs. Um, I'm not suggesting that you throw everything out, but over time, once you have a plan, have a blueprint for your fixturing over the course of the next few years, we're going to move to this. This is what we're good at. These are the sizes of parts that we quote on. These are the sizes of production stuff that we have. Let's do more of this, what's efficient for us. It's not an overnight thing. There's programming issues, there's, there's offset issues. Um, I understand it's a massive undertaking uh, for a shop to do. But if you start that with the goal in mind of, we're gonna have a standard, and here's how we're gonna grow, you'll be more efficient over time with the plan. Bernie, one of our attendees says, I have a large factory facility to manage and lean is our religion. Can you offer me any facts and figures to help convince the powers that be? Uh, on the fixturing side, hmm. we will, Jim, we'll have to figure this out. Um, uh, Dave Adams at, David Adams at KCOE actually sent me some information uh, just before this presentation because we were talking about it. He does lean implementation um, and lean consulting and processes. And we were talking about what, in the larger facilities, I need some formulas, you know, some ways to calculate these things out. Uh, but Jim, we'll figure out a way to get that uh, either posted over in the networking lounge or to the folks out there. Uh, and hopefully you can help me clarify where that might go.
And that brings us to the end of this session. Bernie Martin of Rapid Production Marketing, thanks so much for spending part of your day with us here at this Global Spec Machine Tools and Metalworking E event. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great day. And again, I'll be in the networking lounge. Final thought is Genshi Genbutsu. Take a look around your shop. Make sure everything's the way it should be. Have a great day. At the end of this session, please take a moment to click on the survey button and complete the short questionnaire that will appear on your screen. We'll use your feedback to improve the quality of our Global Spec E events, making them an even better investment of your time. At this point, I encourage your participation on the exhibit hall floor where you will find key exhibit booths staffed by manufacturer representatives, engineers, technical specialists, and other professionals. They have a lot of valuable information to share with you, such as new product releases, technology applications, video demonstrations, and a variety of materials. Remember, anything you may have missed from today's event can be viewed again via our on-demand service, but the exhibitors are only here today, so spend some time with them while you can. We'll see you back here in the Conference Center with Ann Mazakas of DP Technologies in just a little while. See you then.